and we're live. Hello, everybody. Today is Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. It is 5.02 p.m. We are not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we are allowed to have Twitter debates. Yeah. Twitter debates with COVID are like a special kind of thing because like um, you like people yell at you on Twitter and you feel sorry for yourself and you have COVID. And so it's um, <coughs> um, so it's like double. Oh my god! So I goodness. poured myself some uh, some some rye and it's squeezed ha half a tangerine into it. Vitamin C. It's medicinal. It, it, you know, blood thinner and vitamin C. There it is. I apologize, Laura. I will try and adjust my volume. Um, and let's. Whoa! GDF disappeared. Well, um, I have seized control of the show, um, and uh, I assume Genevieve will be back momentarily. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, first of all, it is a uh, wolf shirt day, or maybe a Siberian husky shirt day, um, and um, she's back. So the, I will speak softly because the controls are slightly out of my skill set um you sound great all right um so the uh what prompted today's show was uh that yesterday in a kind of extended covid fever dream i wrote a long piece about what i thought was a quite technical issue that uh would move uh, Jack Goldsmith and like five other presidential uh, power scholars, um, which is a piece about the Office of Legal Counsel's traditional interpretation of the clear statement rule, which we can talk about what that is, uh, in application to 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2, which is the Federal Obstruction of Justice Statute, and uh, 18 U.S.C. 371, which um, is uh, the federal uh, fraud conspiracy statute with reference to Donald Trump and John Eastman, the lawyer uh, counsel to the coup. And uh, it's a long piece. I'm actually kind of proud of it. I think it's a pretty good piece. And um, oh, it's hi, good Laura. reading. And. Uh, let's just say it's not one of those lawfare pieces that I expected to uh, 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 spark a major Twitter debate. Uh, but <laughs> the, the estimable Empty Wheel, uh, at Empty Wheel, who is uh, known in real life as Marcy Wheeler, um, uh, uh, which I finally figured out years and years ago, uh, Empty Wheel is actually... M T wheel as in oh. wheel. um uh and uh I was you know so yeah it's one of those revelatory things um definitely not the Oregon Trail vibes that I kept imagining where you had yeah, no, no. <laughs> the uh I think it's very clever actually empty wheel um but it's it's her it's her initials um M T um, and uh, she got very angry at me about this piece. Um, and um, the reason is that she regards it as obvious that Donald Trump is under criminal investigation, whereas mm -hmm. the, the argument of the piece is a kind of meditation on whether there may be a legal impediment to such an investigation. So... And you, you, in the piece, you also suss out that it's not just the question of like legal issues either. And it's also a, an issue of interpretation and not to, yes. I, so I would love to hear more on that. Yeah. So let's, um, let me just finish the Marcy Wheeler story because it has programming implications for the show. So uh, Marcy is, um, I think the right way to say this um, is, um, I think this is objectively defensible. Uh, she's uh, uh, a dyspeptic Twitter presence. She likes to yell at people. <laughs> um, and so today she was yelling at me 
And I actually was having trouble understanding um, uh, exactly what she was, uh, how Mike Godwin says in the chat, I love Marcy, but she is frequently in the pugilistic mode. And that was definitely in the mode that she was in today. Um, and uh, so she was punching at me. And I just said, you know, I'm I, like, I'm not really sure I understand what this argument is about. So why don't you come on and live a fun and let's just, uh, I think it'd be a really uh, uh, useful conversation to figure out what we're disagreeing about. Uh, so she has agreed to come on the show, um, uh, but Pugilism she, Week. <laughs> for, uh, pugilism, it's going to put the P in Pugilism Week, um, at least on one side. Um, uh, but that will be next Wednesday, not today, uh, because she um, is uh, uh, she lives in Ireland, actually, and um, uh, uh, is not up for a late night this evening. Um, uh, so uh, uh, that'll be next Wednesday. Genevieve will will uh, host and moderate the debate, um, and um, Marcy and I will uh, have an airing of differences. Um, all right. I cannot. I cannot wait. I'm so excited. Uh, I have met Marcy Wheeler exactly once in person, um, and um, and I'm. Uh, excited to do it again. <laughs> now, I, 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 I would like to go back to the piece and just okay. kind of lay out some of the groundwork for the audience so that whoever's joining us next week, we don't have to spend so much time laying foundation. Um, right. So this speaks specifically about the Eastman versus Thompson case, um, which was deciding whether or not uh, the emails from John Eastman, who just a ref refresher to our audience, who's a law professor, who probably and clearly did provide Donald Trump with advice aimed at overturning the 2020 election. And whether or not those emails counted as attorney client work privilege, or, uh, work product, and whether or not that was privileged. Am, have I mistakenly said anything yet? <laughs> You're correct so far. Okay. Okay. So, Ben, what struck you most about that decision? I, 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 when I was reading your piece, the first thing that I did notice was how the way that the judge, um, I forgot his name. Um, uh, uh, judge uh, Carter. Carter. Judge Carter. Yeah, David yes. Carter. Judge Carter laid out the actual opinion, helped to set the stage for what he was going to be discussing. And I believe the first section was facts that just agreed upon. Yeah, so I read this, I actually read this opinion expecting to think little of it because the news stories about it were so dramatic, you know, and anytime a judge, um, you know, issues a bombshell of an opinion, I, um, I always pick up the opinion with the assumption that the judge is grandstanding because, you know, hey, you know, dirty little secret folks. There are 800 federal district judges in the United States and some of them love the sound of their voices. And by the way, uh, you know, it's not every day that you get to write an opinion that the president committed crimes and, you know, you're gonna have some rhetorical fun with it. Uh, so as I note in the piece, there is actually only one sentence that even raises that prospect to me, which is the sort of the last paragraph in the, uh, it is an incredibly measured opinion in general. Um, and uh, the factual statement at the beginning of it, which is nine pages, uh, I really urge everybody to read it, is the single most damning thing that has ever been written in the history of the American presidency about any occupant of the office. Um, and I was trying to think like, okay, is there a similar document about Watergate? The answer is no. Is there a similar document? I mean, it's not to say Trump, uh, you know, Trump's behavior was necessarily worse than Nixon's, although I think it was actually much worse. Um, uh, it's also not to say that you know, there's no document like it in the Iran Contra or um, these produced, you know, seven year investigations, Iran Contra and Ken Starr, right? 
and hundreds and hundreds of pages of report, you can't find anything in any of those reports that are as shocking as this nine pages. And um, so I actually think the, the most important thing about this opinion is that as long as there is a recorded history of the American presidency, people will be reading this document, you know, just not for its legal analysis, just for its statement of facts at the beginning. And it's a, it's a remarkable piece of work. It is interesting too, considering the temperature of the country towards the judiciary, that this is where we're going to find the driest, clearest, concisest uh, compilation of those facts in a judicial opinion. Uh, that's my little soapbox moment. Apologies. Right, but a lot of judges would have fucked it up. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there, there are a lot of judges who would have, uh, you know, buried inferences in the factual summary, right, sort of, you know, larded it with rhetoric. Um, mm -hmm. And this is just a very professional, clinical account of the matter in a, in a way that makes it dramatically more powerful. And so, particularly because he does find that there, it's likely that the president was committing a crime and was being helped by his attorney, which is, um, see, this is the part where I struggle with this discussion because I want to go very, very technical and laying it out is more, is more work sometimes, yeah. which is why I admire your writing so much because it's so clear. Um, so first of all, could we discuss very quickly what a clear statement rule is? Because the two statutes at issue um, you described earlier. Right. So, so let's, there's something we need to do in between, which is, and this is where Marcy gets mad at me. Um, so the gist of my piece said, hey, this is the most damning thing ever written about a president, and it does not, will not necessarily trigger a federal criminal investigation of Donald Trump. And Marcy is upset at me about this because she thinks it is obvious that there is already a federal criminal investigation of Donald Trump. And I'm gonna reserve that question for next week because Marcy's gonna come on and you know we're gonna have pugilism day about it. Um, and um, that said, um, and so this article is kind of about why if the Justice Department doesn't hasn't already opened on on Trump, it this opinion, despite its power, doesn't necessarily mean it will. Um, so the answer to this question, in my opinion, may lie, and I'm not saying does lie, but I am I think it may lie in an, a set of opinions that the Office of Legal Counsel at Justice um, has issued about what is called the clear statement rule. And the clear statement rule uh, in brief, and you can, you can get really nerdy really fast on that subject, um, but in brief, the clear statement rule says that a, a statute of general applicability, so you can't drive more than 55 miles an hour, cannot be presumed to apply to the President of the United States um, unless there is a clear statement in the statute that it does. So you can't drive more than 55 miles an hour, even if you're the President of the United States, satisfies the clear statement rule but you can't drive more than 55 miles an hour without it, cannot be presumed to apply to the president if the application to the president might encumber or, or uh, in, impinge on the conduct of his constitutional responsibility. Which I have found to be fascinating because anything then, because it's the president's constitutional duty to see to enforce the laws of the United States. 
So then <laughs> we get into this moment in my brain where unless then any statute explicitly states that it's applicable to the president because he's enforcing them, and ha that would require some interpretation, I would imagine, from his office. How big is this gray area? Well, so the so let let's say let let's let's identify first of all how gray the gray area is. Okay, because before you get to how big it is, it's like so. First of all, does the plain statement rule, clear statement rule, even exist? Um, OLC, which is the legal office that defines the law for the executive branch, has asserted its existence for decades. Um, for So in the executive branch, it exists. Right. But no court has ever found it. Um, and so Judge Carter, in this opinion, makes no reference to it when he interprets these statutes. He says, hey, Donald Trump probably committed crimes here. Uh, because he's not asking, he's just reading the law. The law says you can't obstruct justice. He's not reading the law in light of the plain statement rule, and nobody told him to, because the Justice Department isn't party to this litigation. So that's one area of gray. Does the statute, ex does the rule exist at all, right? Uh, the Supreme Court has never found that it exists, although it found some it there are some supreme court rulings that the justice department interprets as requiring it uh second area of gray if it exists what does it apply to so does it apply to just civil rules so like hey if you if you create a rule that all federal government employees have to file financial disclosures and you don't include the president in that the president you know they uh, they will tend, justice will tend to read the law as not applying to the president. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, though the president does file a financial disclosure, uh, because I think there's a, that does have a plain statement rule, um, a clear statement in it. Um, uh, that's a relatively uncontroversial area. Uh, it's related to you know, the fact that all laws that interpret, that describe federal agencies, uh, the White House has traditionally read them as not including the White House or the NS, the National Security Council, because it's not an agency. It's actually the executive office of the president. Is that right? Well, the courts have bought it. Um, and so, you know, I think on the civil side with with regard to certain ethics rules and stuff, kind of everybody, it's just kind of reasonably accepted that, hey, if you want to regulate the presidency, you got to kind of say the president. Yeah. Does it apply to criminal laws? That's a kind of like more extravagant position, right? Um, uh, and some criminal laws, it's kind of easy to apply it to. Um, for perhaps shooting someone in Times Square. <laughs> well, so that's, you know, presumably more of a state law issue. But, <laughs> but, but, but let's say, um, you know, you say, uh, hey, intentionally killing somebody is illegal. And you don't apply that to the president who actually has the legal authority intentionally to kill people. Right, you know whether it's in targeted killing contexts or launching wars. So you say, well, okay, clearly Congress isn't thinking about the presidency in that context, and so the hey, killing an American overseas, uh, as Barack Obama did with Anwar al alawki right? Um, you know, generally not legal, violates a criminal statute you don't apply that criminal statute to the presidency acting in its official capacity as the presidency. Um, uh, but then there's the things that regulate conduct that don't obviously implicate the president's authority, like saying obstruction of justice. Um, uh, um, oh, I, I, uh, 
GDF, I think we may have a troll issue going on. Uh, you have the comm, so I think there may be a banning thing necessary. Um, uh, so the question of what the clear statement rule does and doesn't cover as a theoretical matter, very interesting, very hard gray area. And then, of course, there's the Trump specific questions, which uh, at Pet Noodle raises uh, um, in the chat. She writes, but staging a coup isn't part of the official role of the presidency, one hopes, right? And so then there's this question of how you interpret the clear statement rule. Um, and what counts as part of the presidency encumbering the functions of the presidency. So here, what Donald Trump is accused of is leaning on Mike Pence corruptly to uh, not fulfill his own obligation to the transfer of power and the certification. We're certifying. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if anybody else did that, I would think there's no question to, in my mind that that's obstruction within 1512C2. If you buy the clear statement rule, you can say, well, as as uh, at Pet Noodle just did, hey, wait a minute, that's launching a coup. That's not the functions of the presidency. That has nothing to do with the constitutional law of the presidency. On the other hand, if you construe it more narrowly and you say, hey, the president lobbying the vice president about how to conduct his official responsibilities is exactly, is, is a core presidential function. And the fact that, you know, you know, it's really no different from blowing up Anwar al-Awlaki overseas. You might not like the way he did it, and you might think it's, and it may violate the strict terms of a federal statute, but, um, so here's the question. How does OLC understand this? We know that they do, they, they believe the state, clear statement rule exists. We know that they think it has some interaction with the president's, um, with the application of the criminal law to the president, but we don't know the parameters of their position because the opinions were made public. Um, and so um, uh, my hypothesis is that we have some very broad OLC opinions that emanate from Bill Barr's handling of the Mueller report and that those opinions uh, may not have yet been withdrawn or may not ever be withdrawn. Um, and that the Justice Department is therefore not yet formally um, uh, open on Trump because as a, as a be, because it has not yet resolved that issue or because it has decided um, that um, uh, that it, it actually has decided that the um, uh, uh, that it has decided to respect the prior art within the department. So okay. Marcy thinks this is ridiculous because, um, in fact, the uh, it is obvious that an investigation is open. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not think it is obvious that an investigation in which Trump is a subject is open, or Eastman for that matter. And so I'm puzzled by the question of why. Yeah. I, I'm very, very excited to see where this leads us next week. And now we are joined by Mr. Pete Struck. How are you this evening? Good. Hey, hopefully you can hear me. We can hear you just fine, but you've come in at an, at an opportune moment because you, um, I want to ask you a question about, you know, as somebody who has done complex federal investigations, including of some very high profile people, including Donald Trump. Do you <laughs> think that Marcy is persuasive that it is obvious that a federal investigation of Trump as a subject, not merely people around him, not pe not, but that there is a federal criminal investigation involving Trump as subject, that it is obvious that such an investigation is open? I don't think it's obvious. 
I think it's possible. And as a case in point, I would point you to Crossfire Hurricane, which was the kind of umbrella that started the look at Russia's offer of assistance to help the Trump campaign. We opened that at the end of July 2016. And that was, it's called an umbrella investigation that was very small and focused, like who was the person who received this offer of assistance? And we opened up cases on Manafort and Flynn and Papadopoulos and, and Carter Page. And as time went on, we continued to see and open cases on you know, Roger Stone and others that you know don't matter, but some you have heard of, some you haven't. But it wasn't until much later in 2017, well into the spring, after Comey had been fired, that the case was actually opened on Donald Trump, which was both an obstruction case as well as a counterintelligence case. But the point being that everybody could look at Trump's behavior throughout 2016 and well into 2017, and there were both concerns, and more importantly, from the Bureau's perspective, there was plenty of predication that was sufficient to open a case on Trump, but that didn't happen for months and months and months and months. So I don't know. I, you know, I think there is way too much. You know, I follow Marcy on Twitter. I think she's excellent um, at, at what she does and her knowledge and how she follows things. But I don't think it is necessarily. I, I do believe there are things going on, and clearly there is an active investigation into Rudy. The information presumably there that are either on his devices or through his iCloud backups or other places. There is undoubtedly information that is relevant to Trump's behavior and Trump's activity. But I don't know. I would not say it is necessarily true that therefore there is a case on Trump open right now. And, but and I don't just know. to just to be clear, so when you opened on Trump in May of 2017, um, that was in a counterintelligence context, though there was a concurrent criminal investigation open. What is functionally the difference from the just, I've, this is something I've literally never understood. Um, so in arguing Marcy's side for a minute, and I actually have a passage in the piece in which I, uh, in which I allude to this, that, you know, investigations really aren't of people, they're of crimes. And um, here we know we have a crime of, of, of like a gazillion crimes, January 6th. And so there's an investigation open of the fact pattern. You collect all kinds of shit in the context of that, Shit is a technical term for evidence. Um, and then different subjects kind of drift in and out of the case as you, you come to focus on different people. And so when you say, you know, Marcy would say, and I, and you know, this is a, I actually sort of said this in, in the piece, of course there's an investigation of Trump and it's called the January 6th investigation. Whereas I would say, yeah, there's a, actually a difference between having an umbrella investigation and having identified a particular individual, particularly a high profile individual, as a subject in a fashion that involves taking investigative steps directed at that person rather than investigative steps that are, you know, directed at somebody else, but maybe with an eye toward hey, you know, this Genevieve de la Farra character, is, you know, she's she keeps coming up in all these stuff like we should. So what does it actually mean to, <coughs> to excuse me, to open on somebody? Well, I, I think you've framed it very well. And I mean, in a criminal context, I think when you're opening a case, you're opening a case because there is sufficient predicate. In other words, sufficient facts or reason to believe that the person engaged in behaviors which merit an FBI investigation. And that can be on the criminal side pretty straightforward. They, you know, they are or may have violated the law. On the national security side, particularly in a counterintelligence environment, it may not be a violation of the law so much as they are acting as an agent of a foreign power. They're being targeted by an agent of a foreign power. And there isn't some necessarily a, you know, something in Title 18 that you open up the criminal code and you find that they violated it. But I think broadly you're absolutely right that in both contexts, you know, whether it's a criminal case, whether it's a counterintelligence case, if I'm looking at a particular subject, I may be getting sort of incidental information about people on the periphery. But when I start asking for, you know, getting to the point where I say there, there is this person that I have sufficient interest about, and again, lawful predication that I want to do things like getting their 
phone records, getting their email records, getting their financial records, getting, you know, subpoenaing all of those are using a national security letter. When you are targeting a person or need to target them like that, you need that in my mind is like one of the things like, you know, okay, we're, we're, we need a case on this person. And there are, I mean, this is frequently the case of, you know, there's a balancing test. It isn't a, frequently, there is not a very evident, clear line of, we don't have enough to open a case. And then suddenly, okay, clearly we do and we should. There's a lot of gray in that middle area where you hit a point where you're, you think you're close and probably you do have enough. But there's also the question of, okay, do you, you know, you don't open a case just to open a case on somebody. If you open a case, ideally you should be opening a case because you're going to pursue investigation. And then particularly with somebody at the level, at a high level like Trump, you know, yeah, you might buy the book, buy the AG guidelines, buy the FBI's, you know, various guidelines and procedures have sufficient articulable reason to open a case. But if you're not going to really do something like that or be able to the point of doing, you know, going out and subpoenaing records and interviewing people, there might be an argument, let's wait and continue to build the surrounding cases before we get to the point that we actually open a case on this individual. So I, you know, and I, I would, the last thing I'd say to all of this is I can't stress enough that we don't know all of the things that are going on and we have no idea what we don't know. And it's really dangerous in the abstract to assume things that are occurring are not occurring because it is the, the, I can come up with thousands of potential scenarios of what cases are open or closed or what the goals are or why the timing is what it is and or, or is not. And without being able to get on the inside to see all the dynamics at play, it's nearly impossible to prognosticate. The extent I would prognosticate is to say to people, Give DOJ the benefit of the doubt because things take time. I don't think they're asleep at the wheel. I don't think they're missing the urgency of what's going on. I do think for a variety of reasons, if there was a problem, we would know about it. And mm-hmm. and, and that's kind of the extent of what I guess about because this is all guessing. And, and one of the things also, Ben, you nod to this in your piece is the evidentiary, evidentiary standards that apply are very different in the case that we were discussing in the article versus actual criminal cases. So for this particular Eastman case, the preponderance of the evidence standard, which just means that you have to have more than 50% to be, find that to be a persuasive conclusion versus beyond a reasonable doubt, which requires a much higher burden of proof. Right. And, and actually, uh, I mean, this is, you know, I think for this purpose, even more important Judge Carter does not have to consider the clear statement question, whereas whether there's a case open or not, or whether you're going to define this later at the can we bring an indictment against Trump phase, there is just no way the Justice Department is not going to have a serious conversation about it, um, uh, you know, about that. And so, you know, it's quite easy if you're Judge Carter, and I'm not criticizing him, the matter wasn't before him, to say, hey, yeah, it's likely the president committed a crime. It's a very different matter if you're contemplating indicting Donald Trump for that behavior to uh, uh, you, you are not going to blithely skip over something. And by the way, the evidence of that is that Bob Mueller did not blithely skip over it. There is a 25 page memo in the Mueller report about how he believes the clear statement rule interacts with this exact statute is something he took very seriously. So I, I want to ask one other opening and investigation question, um, <coughs> which is, is that really a Justice Department thing or is it an FBI thing? Um, in other words, if you're a Justice Department prosecutor, you don't like the concept of opening an investigation rather than eventually the bureau comes to you and says, Hey, we think we've got a case on so-and-so is whether a case is, you know, you have the in lieu of fun investigation where the bureau is kind of looking at whether crimes are committed in connection with in lieu of fun. And then they decide, okay, they're opening specifically on Genevieve. Um, but from the Justice Department's point of view, it's like, hey, eventually the Bureau comes and says, hey, we think we, we've got a case on Delaferra and Wittes. And they don't say, 
but yeah, but have you opened on them yet? Right? Is, is, is this really an FBI bureaucratic distinction rather than a, a Justice Department distinction? Like everybody's talking about this as though Merrick Garland is like, hmm, have we opened an investigation yet? I, so I, as a technical matter, opening cases is done by the FBI under the FBI's authority. Now, there are some cases, depending on how referrals come in, those get routed through DOJ and there's consultation. But what causes a case to be open in an investigative sense is done by the FBI under the FBI's authorities and approved by people within the FBI. Having said that, there are cases. And I just want to say that you are looking right here at the man who wrote the opening document for the Russia investigation, George Papadopoulos. Sorry. No, no he well it wasn't him. You it wrote was based on well it was right. based on his it was based on him presumably running his mouth to a friendly foreign diplomat. But you know, and, and so a couple of points to that. The the most important, well, let's get the small technical one out of the way. DOJ can uh, and I'm the wrong person to ask about the little minute details of what might be done within the US attorney's office if they are opening. They have their own cases, right? They do not kind of put all their paperwork into the FBI case file. There is a case, there is a, a management system within every U.S. attorney's office that AUSA is working a case, put things into. And that is a separate, that is a separate matter that, again, get Chuck Rosenberg or any good AUSA, he can tell you the ins and outs of how that's done. But in terms of an investigation, when it comes out to going out and collecting information and interviewing people, that's done by the FBI, under the FBI's authorities, approved by the FBI. The broader point, though, is when you hit somebody at this level, when you get to the point of the president or former president of the United States, I would be shocked if the decision about whether or not to open a case was not the topic of conversation, probably multiple conversations, at a minimum involving the attorney general, deputy attorney general, the director of the FBI, and the deputy director of the FBI. Before it was open, now, could the FBI waltz into some morning intel brief one day and you know just after the PDB say, oh, by the way, we opened in Trump? Yes. Would that be... <laughs> Would that be less than ideal for any number of reasons? Yes, it would. So I, I cannot envision a scenario where, to your point about, is Merrick Garland actually sitting there wondering about it? I My strong sense is that he is certainly aware of the progress and thinking of where the facts are leading currently and in the past that might get to the point of opening a case or cases or whatever the the, the, the resolution might be around Trump. Is it going to be the thing where Director Ray goes to him and says, Mr. Attorney General, we want to open the case. Are you OK with that? Not necessarily, but I cannot easily envision a scenario where the Attorney General is not very much aware of where things stand with that sort of tipping point about any investigation of Trump. Yep, you went dead. Okay, we're going to go to audience questions. Ben, you were muted, so I apologize if I cut you off. Oops. Sorry. Um, Yay, I have one thing we need to do before, before we go to audience questions. Pete, you have a uh, an important new item in your background. Yes, that's, a, that's my Ukraine flag. It's our, our Lady of Perpetual Javelin, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. I don't want so wait, make, anybody, make, anybody make who full is screen a, so we can see it. Anybody who is, I, I'm not in engaging in any sort of Steve Bannon iconography uh, by doing it. And I in no way want to insult anybody who is religious to the point where the the uh, image of our Blessed Virgin holding a javelin uh, missile would be offensive. But uh, yeah, I'm happy you get about it? that. And I got it through a uh, website, which is, uh, I think, Our Lady of the Javelin or something like that. I think it's Canadian based and at least they claim that they are taking the proceeds of their sales and, and shipping it off to do good. So I have to I, get one of those no for way. my mom. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'm not, you know, there is, there, there's just war and, you know, Thomas Aquinas and all kinds of people talked about the context in which war is just. And so I display that in that spirit. And anyway, so Excellent. audience questions. Yes. I, I also just want to clarify. I said that because my mom is half Ukrainian, <laughs> so well, I didn't. Yeah, it that. doesn't. Yeah, yeah, even even better. But yeah, I thought you were. Uh, That's I dad. always think of you as full Italian. Oh no, I'm I'm a very much a very happy mutt. 
Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to bring up Paula, our delightful green screen today. I'm Paula, sorry. Your green rectangle. You match uh, our lady of the javelin. Yes, I'm in a location that I don't want to disclose to the internet. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering in regards to the clear statement rule, doesn't it run counterintuitive to in the U.S. code when they clearly lay out in definitions that this does not apply to the president or vice president or specific em federal employees? Wouldn't that be like an inconsistent rule to have where sometimes you lay out who it applies to and then sometimes you don't? So I am not going to defend the clear statement rule because, <laughs> because I actually think as OLC has articulated it, it is something close to indefensible, um, although with important caveats. Um, like that said, I don't think that's one of the reasons. So um, most criminal law is passed without reference to the president because it, it, uh, um, it applies to situations that you're just not imagining. Like when you have a let's uh, take your average, you know, federal criminal law it does not arise in a situation that implicates the presidency. It wasn't passed with, you know, bank fraud statutes, right? The wire fraud statutes. These are not responding to problems that are perceived in the presidency. And so they're passed with, in one way or another without reference to the presidency. Um, and the question of how you apply those to the presidency is essentially is always going to be complicated because you know it like let's if joe biden sneaks out at night uh you know evades his security detail and goes and robs a liquor store um i don't think anybody even bill barr would say uh, or make it Donald Trump so that Bill Barr would have an incentive to say. But I think in that situation, Bill, even Bill Barr wouldn't say, hey, there's a, you know, <laughs> the president's just allowed to do that. Or to use GDF's example, if Donald Trump actually just walked outside and shot somebody on Fifth Avenue and it had nothing to do, you know, he did it because he had gotten drunk and he was really mad at the guy because they had an argument, not because, you know, he thought he was you know, protecting the White House grounds or something. Um, I, you know, I don't think anybody would argue that that is insulated by the fact that the relevant murder statute doesn't have a clear statement. That said, the that line, and I don't have the OLC opinion in front of me, that, you know, if the application could, you know, could encumber the, the I forget the language, but basically could, in, Arguably, well, arguably, arguably encumber or arguably affect uh, the the exercise of the presidency. Um, that's a huge gray area. What that means, and and so, you know, I don't think it's reasonable to ask legislators to, whenever they write a criminal code law, decide whether they want the presidency included or excluded from it. That just seems like a, a sort of needless legislative burden. Uh, that said, there are these statutes, and the obstruction statute is the most important, but the conspiracy to defraud the United States statute is, you know, the 371 is an important one as well, particularly in this context. Congress gave no direction how they meant it to be applied to the presidency. OLC, uh, or the Justice Department here, has a conflict of interest and, and in the best sense of the word. On the one hand, they're the prosecutors. On the other hand, they're the guardians of presidential power. And so you're going to have, there are a lot of prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington who would take the clear statement rule and shove it up Bill Barr's ass because they want to make, they want to make cases. Um, but there's this office in the Justice Department called the Office of Legal Counsel, and it's a great office and, and it does really, really important work in a number of areas. One of the things it does is it protects the presidency um, uh, from all kinds of encroachments um, as, as they see it. And the clear statement rule is going to be really important to them because it's what protects, from their point of view, the president from 
you know, presidents probably do things all the time that violate criminal laws in some place somewhere, right? And without having some way to, you know, to restrain some federal prosecutor wanting to enforce those against the president, um, you know, you could imagine that, uh, and in the civil law context, it, it gets really out of control. So it's actually a legitimately complicated issue. Okay, our next question is from Richard. Um, so I, I'm curious, do we have uh, cases where the Supreme Court has looked at uh, DOJ policy, including OLC opinions, and said, uh, now that's, that's bullshit, we're throwing it out, and we're going to strike that down, or do they pretty much respect uh, what, right, what the OLC has said? Uh, so the Supreme Court owes no deference to OLC. Um, OLC is an interpretive office, uh, and when the Supreme, when the when the Justice Department confronts has a litigation um, in which they have to articulate the positions of the government, uh, that is done by the Solicitor General's office, not by OLC, and it's not a particularly, from the Supreme Court's point of view, saying for the Justice for the Solicitor General's office to say, hey, the Justice Department has this interpretation is a little bit like Exxon saying, well, our general counsel's office says this, therefore you should rule it. Um, it's not, it's not a, uh, it, it's not an office that has external facing, particularly the court's uh, uh, authority. What it does do is bind the executive branch. So yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court disagrees with OLC all the time. Now the wrinkle to that is that there are certain issues that because OLC has ruled on the Supreme Court never gets to hear. And the most important of those is the question of the amenability of the indict of the president to criminal indictment. So Bob Mueller concludes that the president obstructs justice, though he won't admit that he concluded that, but he did. Um, and um, but he can't bring a case against the president for obstructing justice um, because OLC can't, says he can't, and he's bound by OLC opinions. The result is that there's no way the, the integrity of OLC's opinion on the subject ever gets in front of the Supreme Court because, you know, there's the normal way would be the Justice Department indicts the president, the president moves to dismiss on grounds that he's not amenable to indictment. It goes up through the courts, the Supreme Court decides who's right. But since OLC binds the executive branch, uh, the matter becomes effectively non-justiciable. There are a lot of issues like that. Um, so it's not that the Supreme Court uh, owes anything to OLC, it's that uh, the nature of OLC adjudications of issues actually can prevent the Supreme Court from ruling on them. All right, Daniel, the floor is yours. I am, so I want to take the Trump being investigated for a crime several steps down the road. And so if Trump goes to trial in which he's an alleged criminal defendant, what kind of steps would a judge have to take to field an impartial jury? <laughs> Fabulous question. Do you have thoughts on this, Pete? You've been, been in front I, of a lot of juries. I mean, I just, I mean, I, I, my thought is they would try and hew as close to normal practice as possible. And there are cases where defendants are extraordinarily well known and you end up seating a jury where the jury has heard of the individual and the facts surrounding it. And at the end of the day, it comes down to a question of whether or not you can, you know, despite your beliefs and what you know, whether you can render a, you know, unbiased and partial decision based on the facts presented at trial. I don't, you know, in this case where it, you know, is, is there a fair voir dire question of, you know, who did you vote for? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, 
my assumption would be that there would be a way to seat a jury. I don't know how you would, I don't know the ins and outs of kind of jury selection well enough to give a very though competent answer to that. Uh, I, first of all, I think there, I'm not sure there is a authoritative answer to that. It's an unprecedented situation, but I, I think it's quite doable, actually. So at the end of the day, um, what is a fair jury? It's not a jury that's never heard of the case before. Uh, it's not a jury that doesn't have some opinions on relevant matters. For example, uh, people who either support or oppose the death penalty are put on death jurors, all the juries all the time, right? Um, I think you probably want to avoid in this jury people like me who are inspired in life by passionate loathing of Donald Trump. Um, and you similarly, I think, a reasonable question for uh, a defense, uh, a prosecution lawyer would be, do you own a MAGA hat? You know, have you ever worn one in public as a statement of political affiliation, right? Like there, I think you you want people who are not passionately for or against the man. Yeah. And, and one thing, Ben, I would add is like, you know, it, it's unprecedented for a president to be tried in that way. But we've done congressmen, senators all the time, sure. frequently in their district. And so it's the same, not at the same scale, but somebody who is a well-known political figure who presumably jurors voted for or against are being asked to sit and set aside whatever preconceived notions or actions they may have taken to render a verdict. And so I think I, I think that's probably the best analog to how to think about the president and you know whatever district and presumably DC it would be the district that he is brought to trial if and when that happens. But I think the best way to think about how to do that would be to look to public corruption cases of nationally elected officials. I think that's exactly right. And I also think that DC, you know, has, uh, it's a very attractive venue from a prosecution point of view, because first of all, it's obviously the location of the crime. Uh, assuming you, assuming the crime is January 6th related, that's where Trump, Donald Trump was at the time. Uh, but secondly, it's a, you know, deeply democratic city. It's not a city where you're likely to be uh, sandbagged with a secret, you know, Trump voter who's, uh, or, you know, Trump enthusiast. Um, and, uh, and so I think the question from a judge's point of view is really going to be more one of fairness to the defendant. Um, like there's no question that you could get a DC jury that would convict. The question is whether you could get a DC jury that would be fair to Donald Trump. And as a like a resident of the District of Columbia, I I believe that there are thousands and thousands of juries that you could put together in this city uh, that would be scrupulously fair and would take their jury instructions extremely seriously and would put aside views of matters and rule based on what they saw in court. And that's all you, and like that, I, you know, just believe that. And so I, I think it's doable. Would it, you'd go through a lot of one ear panels for it. <laughs> um, and I was actually on a ju DC jury voir dire panel once with uh, Eric Holder and with Harvey Rishikoff, who later went on to be the convening authority in the Guantanamo military commissions. And I was the Eric Holder who was about to be named attorney general and who was a former U.S. attorney in the jurisdiction and therefore chief prosecutor in that court. Uh, was the, the judge took one look at, look at him, burst out laughing and dismissed him. And he goes, he says to Harvey and me, bye guys, and walks out. Um, and Harvey uh, and I was the last person dismissed. Um, presumably on a peremptory challenge and I've never known which side uh, next me. And Harvey was the foreman of the jury. Uh, and so, you know, like DC juries are weird as hell because it's a small town. Um, but like, I'm sure that defendant got a fair trial. John Hawkinson, the floor is yours. Oh, 
Hold on one second. Don't click anything. Your mic is not cooperating with me. I'm having a really hard time unmuting you. Just go to Mateo and kick John out and bring him back in while Mateo's asking his question. All right. Uh, oh, am I on? You're good. Great. Uh, my question is just a quick one about the um, clear statement rule. Uh, it seems to me that it could be meant either to uh, keep the president from having to deal with like a parking ticket while he's supposed to be doing more important things or to make sure he's allowed to speed in service of, uh, you know, doing a better job. Um, Neither. I, Neither. I, th I think the purpose of the clear statement rule is to prevent Congress. So because there are criminal statutes that Congress could pass or civil statutes that mm -hmm. Congress could pass that would so encumber the presidency that they would be unconstitutional general purpose statutes. But if you applied them to the presidency, it would be unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have an example you know, of something like that? How about everyone, you know, everyone must wear a hat in meetings with foreign, you know, if a foreign head of state in the District of Columbia. Um, and the president of the United States says, wait a minute, I'm the one who's constitutionally entrusted, entrusted with conducting foreign policy. Congress really can't tell me what hat to wear when I meet with Vladimir Putin. So I'm going to interpret the statute as just not applying to me. Right. So that would be a, a, a frivolous example. But sure. but you can think of a million substantive examples of, of you know, a rule that Congress passes to to. Uh, uh, to create a, uh, for general consumption, not thinking about the presidency. And the president says, wait a minute, if, if you insist on this with respect to me, you're actually infringing on my constitutional responsibilities. Uh, how about this one? It shall be a crime to prevent Congress from enacting a federal law. And the president says, wait a minute, the Constitution gives me a veto over Congress, you know, over a congressional statute. Surely, as applied to the veto, that is unconstitutional, right? So these are so in order to protect the the, the presidency from the application of rules that were not passed with the presidency in mind, the 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 clear statement rule says, okay, if Congress wants to apply it to the presidency, it can do that. It just has to say so, right? It has to say it clearly that it means for this to be applied to the presidency. Um, and that way, at least we'll know whether they intended to set up a constitutional issue to the extent the president thinks it's unconstitutional. So it's not, it's, it, it's it's to ensure that you don't have separation of powers problems without Congress intending separation of powers problems to arise. Okay, John, let's try this okay. again. Here you Great. go. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me now because it looks like I'm unmuted. Great. So I think it's clear, and tell me if I'm wrong, that the House Select Committee is necessarily coordinating with DOJ in some way, regardless of whether there's an open investigation. And we can tell a little bit about- Almost certainly not. Well, okay. Uh, and, and therefore we could tell a little bit about the status of a DOJ investigation based on what the House Select Committee has revealed. And they've revealed things in three different ways. One, they've revealed things publicly uh, through press releases. Two, there have been leaks. And three, maybe most significantly in the litigation before Judge Carter, the Eastman uh, versus Thompson litigation, they filed things that I think they would otherwise not have filed uh, transcripts and so forth of depositions uh, for the purpose of convincing Judge Carter that they're right. So uh, I guess we have Ben knocking it out initially, but I'm curious what the rest of you think. So I don't, I'm unmuted. I don't, I don't think that's no, necessarily good. indicia of coordination. Um, and I look, I, I have had congressmen of both parties externally angry at me for not providing more information about what the executive was doing investigatively. Um, 
on the Democratic side, the most recent was um, Congressman Schiff furious at me about not providing more information about what was going on with the Bureau in Russia in the fall of 16. And the one and only and certainly last time Devin Nunez ever defended me was at that briefing. Um, so I don't think it's unusual that Congress would be angry and want more information about what the executive branch is doing from an investigative point of view. I have some, and, and I don't think, you know, depositions are depositions that Congress did. The records that I've seen mentioned are those that Congress has subpoenaed. I have not seen any inclusion, and I would be shocked, frankly, to see inclusion of material obtained from a executive, from, from a Article II investigation being included in a an un, not previously released Article Three or I'm sorry, Article One um, pleading or argument or document. So I don't think there's sharing going on. And you know what interests me, and this is a little bit of a side note. So I take with a grain of salt this criticism coming out of the January Sixth Committee about their deep concerns and frustration with DOJ, because I think some of it is unwarranted. Yes, of course they want more information. They want more information sharing. They want to know some like nod or wink or, or shake of the head no about where DOJ is or isn't going, and I don't think they're going to get it. But if there is more there, and part of me wonders based on the volume and sort of tenor that I heard during the the the, the contempt vote two nights ago and whenever it was, if there is more there. I think it's important for them to say what that is. And, you know, again, this is all speculative, but if they, in the course of doing, you know, they finally go to some provider who's got, you know, they served a preservation order on Verizon for email traffic of a certain congressman that very clearly is potentially involved in the criminal activity. And I'm making all this up. Verizon gives that to Congress and says, you know, by the way, you're the only people who have asked us for this. Kind of a wink, wink. In other words, nobody from DOJ, the FBI has asked for this at all. If there are things like that out there, and I'm not saying there are, but that is the kind of thing that would give me concern if that's like underlying some of this congressional frustration beyond just a simple, oh, we want more information from the executive. Um, but I don't, I, I agree with Ben, I think. I, I, I would be very surprised in my experience to the extent there's any, both Congress and the executive branch are really loath to get in each other's lane. And to the extent there's any flow, I would expect to see it from Congress into DOJ and the FBI and not the other way around at all, at all. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, with There's only one caveat on which I think they do coordinate uh, and it hasn't arisen yet, which is, that, which is that there is a temptation when you're running a, con a congressional investigation to immunize people. Yep, exactly uh, the right. famous The famous example of this is John Poindexter and Oliver North in the Iran-Contra investigation. Uh, when Congress does this, uh, heads all over the Justice Department and the FBI explode, um, and um, and there is therefore sometimes coordination between federal prosecutors uh, and congressional investigators, uh, particularly in regard to the possible handling of witnesses, particularly if they might be immunized. In addition, if you're a Justice Department prosecutor, uh, you hate it when witnesses give depositions uh, and say multiple things in multiple different places. And so you will sometimes have a, a kind of back channel, hey, we're planning on interviewing so-and-so. The Justice Department is clearly deferring to the committee on that. The committee has done just a huge number of, it, of witness interviews. And one of the one of the hypotheses that I actually advance in this piece is, hey, maybe the reason they haven't opened on Trump and Eastman yet is that they're actually deferring to, to you know, doing that investigation concurrently, having, having a, you know, investigative activity directed at Trump right now while the committee is doing the Eastman investigation you could get into a whole lot of cross signals. The statute of limitations is nowhere near now. So, you know, let let them have their fun. They're gonna be done in a few months. And by the way, it will have created a huge record of sworn statements or at least of 1001 prosecutable statements. And so there may be coordination in that sense, like, hey, let's defer this part of the investigation until the committee's out of, out of gas. Um, uh, uh, but I doubt very much that there is information sharing between the two. Um, and 
to the extent that the Justice Department is sharing information with the committee, uh, that is probably unethical. Um, and depending on whether it's grand jury material is criminal. Um, right. It's just not happening. I promise you. Yeah. One, one quick, and I know we're over time. I completely agree with Ben. And I think we are getting to the point come the summertime that this, this now hypothetical issue of immunization is going to become a tangible real issue because as they are going to want to make their case, particularly as both their time runs out and the elections are coming up, you're going to see increasing tension um, there, which is why I just ordered Lawrence Walsh's book, Firewall, um, to kind of read about his thoughts on the impact of the interaction between pursuing a criminal investigation and a congressional investigation at the same time. All right, I do not know enough about this yet to have an opinion, but I look forward to learning more about it one week from today when we debate quite a lot. But Fusionism. Yes, thank you so much for joining us today, Pete. We really appreciate it. And um, in lieu of fun, we'll be back two days from now on Friday, I believe, correct? R right, Ben? I don't think we have anything yep. odd scheduled this week. Um, so Big we look forward question, to question, will I have a negative COVID test before then? Uh, we hope so. <laughs> I, it was still positive today. I'm, <laughs> I'm holding out for long COVID here. <laughs> oh, oh God, no. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be back on Friday and we don't have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, Ben? Uh, we do have debates over whether the Justice Department has an open investigation uh, of Donald Trump, just has a general investigation of people that may or may not include Donald Trump, has deferred an investigation of Donald Trump, and what the fuck difference any of that may mean. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.